Thank you very much for the invitation to contribute to the day symposium on decolonizing natural science collections. The topic of my talk today is the International Artist Research Residence Program, which ran from 2010 to 2014 at the Natural History Museum in London, where I was curator of contemporary art at the time. Through the program, we wanted to reconsider museum practices and scientific objects by providing a display space in the museum's Images of Nature Gallery we engaged in the politics of representation. The program became an opportunity to ask, how can the violence of past collecting and collection practices in the natural sciences be acknowledged? How can these practices be reflected upon now? What constitutes change? Natural history museums, like other museums, are dynamic cultural formations shaped by society. Historically and in the present time, artists and scientists are both part of cultures that seek to discover and to represent the natural world. Natural history museums thus have become complex archives of the representations of nature, and they are places in which to acknowledge and to reflect. In the words of a contemporary artist who worked at the museum, studying the historic collections and who reflects on the late 18th and 19th century formations of museums, says, the main thing for me was the science aspect. It all relates to each other, adds together history, the enlightenment, colonization. These very centuries were characterized by European fantasies of knowledge made into power and by imperial authority over the non-Western world and over non-Western objects. Museums are, however, now under scrutiny from diverse cultural perspectives. What does decolonizing mean in a museum context? Studies of decolonization look at transfers of power, the diversity of languages, and the hybridization of cultures. Significantly, these processes link the history of Europe with the histories of other continents right up to the present time. In a museum context, decolonizing as put forward by the Museum Confederation International, can mean resisting the reproduction of colonial taxonomies while simultaneously vindicating radical multiplicity. By working specifically with international artists and by interrogating the historic scientific illustration collections, we developed a decolonizing approach to the museum's work. Artists were invited to take up residency in London as part of the program at the Natural History Museum, which was run in partnership with the artist studio organization Gasworks, also in London. We hosted three artists, Shanghai-based artist Hu Yun in 2010, Aboriginal Australian painter Daniel Boyd from Sydney, 2011, and Bangalore-based artist Sunaj D, 2012. They each spent a three months research period museum and developed works for an annual display in its then newly opened Images of Nature Gallery. The gallery offered the possibility to integrate the artist's commissions from its inception. This gallery, unlike most of the other exhibition spaces at the museum, is aimed at an adult audience and describes historic and contemporary practices of natural science from observation to recording to communication. The artist's commissions became integrated into the displays, which in the first three years explored historic scientific illustrations from specific geopolitical areas. Hu Yun started with the John Reeves collection from the early 19th century, Daniel Boyd with the drawings and watercolors from the so-called First Fleet collection made when the first British colonizers settled in Australia, and Sunaj D from the numerous collections relating to Indian natural history. Through the respective artists' works, I explain the different artists' strategies of decolonizing the Natural History Museum. Embedded in the discussion of the works here today are extracts from evaluation interviews conducted by independent evaluator Dr. Gabby Porter. The questions of how to change needs to be considered through the artist, museum staff and the visitors together. Here we have one of the quotes from this evaluation by a museum uh, staff member saying, they have come in as artists and non-Europeans, 
with a very different background and perspective on colonialism, on the European view of science, a very different take which generated discussion and raised questions not raised before. Huyen became interested in the study of East India Company tea inspector and naturalist John Reeves and the Chinese draftsman Reeves commissioned to create scientific drawings. The over 2000 botanical and zoological drawings are scientifically important and were commissioned and collected by Reeves while he worked in China from 1812 to 1831. Draftsmen in China, Akut, Akam, Ake and Asung were named and worked alongside others in fact, most of them that remained anonymous. They worked under Reeves' instructions and the drawings were used to name species new to European science. For the installation Memorialized Memory and the drawing Four Tomatoes, which is now in the museum's collection, who Yunus artist remains unnamed to draw attention to the draftsmen who were written out of history. Here's a response by a member of the museum staff. Hu Yin's was invisible artwork. You could easily miss it. This was his intention, but others didn't get it. He didn't want his name to be mentioned. He played on the conventions. Staff understood the program would be happening and expected something show-stopping, dazzling, big. Did his subtlety and sophistication mean that they valued the work less? It was delightful, playful and serious, disturbing preconceptions. Artist Sunaj D researched the museum's art collections from India and the Hortus Malabaricus Garden of Malabar, which was displayed in its first edition. Published between 1678 and 1703, this record is a collaboration of more than 100 contributors from different professions and castes. Contributors included Brahmin physicians Rangabad, Vinyaka Pandit, Apubad, together with the Malali physician Itia Huden, a doctor from the Esava community, to document 742 medicinal plants found in Malabar, now Kerala. Sunaj D's scroll drawing, which you can see here, assembles plants from the Hortus and depicts them in wild disorder, a stark contrast to the catalogue plants of the museum's collection. The installation, the remains of the soil from the land where the sun never set, references the British Empire's extensive global reach during the 19th century and the environment of the Natural History Museum where, as Sunaj D says, everything exists in a state of suspended animation, nothing lives. Sunaj D's work reflects changing cultural fashions of the for the study and representation of plants and created participation. Here a visitor reflects on Sunor's installation. You have got some quite traditional work and then something like that, which is more of an installation and more modern. So you are really crossing all kinds of cultures. Daniel Boyd, spent time researching the first fleet collection, which consists of 629 drawings and watercolours. Created from 1788 onwards, the watercolours, ink and pencil drawings include maps, landscape views, flora and fauna, portraits of individuals of the Eura nation, which is the indigenous population of the Denvarana, um, or Port Jackson and what is now modern day Sydney. The artist's initial interest was to probe how colonial images inform contemporary society and how we interact with these images today. In his gallery installation, Up and Smoke Tour, Boyd displayed a series of watercolors held within archival boxes, like those used in the museum's anthropology collection now. His images are appropriations of historic images of Sydney Harbour, plants, a human skull from Australia, a portrait of an individual of the Eura nation, and sculptures from Vanuatu. His layered watercolors deliberately, deliberately fracture the historic image. These works are, and I quote Boyd, like an erasure of memory or history in an image or object. The loss of information empowers me, the viewer, 
is put in the position where they don't have that information. Void deconstructed ways of seeing. Ideas about land, colonial relations and encounters. This process allowed Boyd to relate dispossession and colonization to his own contemporary experience and to reclaim his own history. Further to his initial research, Boyd's interest in the museum's anthropology collection led him to investigate possible ancestral links to individuals in the human remains collection and how the museum deals with remains currently in the museum's possession. His search led him to a skull believed to be taken from a burial ground west of Brisbane, which might relate to his ancestry. To conclude, the artist's scholarship had extraordinary attentiveness to evidence. The approaches were those of appropriation of materials, collection care conventions and bureaucracies and signs. The artist employed historical and archival research methods in order to draw attention to gaps in and ownership of knowledge. Furthermore, in studying specific material objects through their biographies, one of the artists addressed questions of ownership that might lead to restitution. The artist's works and the processes leading up to these showed that for the artist, science is a set of cultural practices through which knowledge is constructed, encompassing collecting practices modes of representation within the historical and colonial or imperial context. This realization affected staff members and the public alike. But the authority of the institution is felt throughout. The images of the research, the installing, the displays, which I showed here, are always framed by the institution. The images somewhat belie the complex emotional labor to negotiate the search for inspiration and independence, the opportunities and support in making the works and the challenges to collection care practices. These were all long negotiations, some with compromises, some were disappointing, some were successful. By decolonizing, I referred here to revisiting and challenging the institutional taxonomies, scientific practices and colonial impositions while speaking out for cultural multiplicity and recognition. The artist's works represent complex issues in a new, deeply personal language, giving agency to objects and creating new social relations. The institution opened up to give representational space to artists as agents, reflecting on the history of the natural sciences. But this forward-looking initiative was cut short when the museum later decided that cultural practice had no place within a scientific research institution. However, artists and scientists alike can create diverse fora for public critical exchanges. These are to address injustices embedded in the practice of science, to find new forms of critique and to co-create new knowledge. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the artists, colleagues at the Natural History Museum, Gasworks, Dr. Gabby Porter, and members of the public and the funders to support this program. Hello, thank you very much for that talk, Birgit. A fascinating insight into a different way of approaching the subject and some really powerful responses that uh, the public have, have given to this work. Uh, while well, we're just seeing if there are any other questions, I think there might be a question. Uh, regarding the skull, Daniel Boyd research that might be related to his ancestry, yeah. was there any continued research into this and whether repatriation should be offered or considered? Um, not as far as I'm aware. I know that um, he, um, so actually to backtrack to that on that slide, you could you could see uh, there were three images of the, uh, of the, the box and then his image and then the photograph. Um, so he took this photograph, which, strictly speaking, um, it's not to be made public. So um, he wanted this to make public in order to start the discussion, um, which I think is, an, we, we can talk about this actually, you know, how, um, because he sought access to the collection which he was given. And he made this uh, image uh, in, this, in this shadow version public. Uh, and that was the beginning. And maybe so far that's enough for him, but he was thinking about um, pursuing that. 
Um, however, at the time, uh, there was a colleague at the Natural History Museum who dealt specifically with the repatriation of human remains, and I believe she's since retired as well, so I don't know what the situation is at the Natural History Museum. Um, so I was trying to say, you know, there are these, um, these aspects of engaging with collections differently, maybe also with human repatriation. I cannot speak for the Natural History Museum now, what it's doing in terms of um, repatriation. These sort of seem to come in waves and they seem to open up and close down or, you know, and be funded and not get funded and so on. So uh, um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. But as far as I know, he has not officially put in something which needs to be, if I'm still, if it's still as it was at the time, it needs to be done through the Australian government. Yeah, cannot be done. In person. Yeah, thank you. Uh, are the artworks still on display? Do you know? Sorry, are the artworks still on display? No. So um, there was a changing annual program, temporary program within the Images of Nature Gallery. So in the first year, you had works from um, China from the Reefs Collection, and then the artist works were always embedded with that annual display. So it changed on an annual basis. So the last one that you saw, or the, not that you saw, but the, the last one in the program was by Sunaj D, and he had a sort of changing display throughout those 12 months. So, and when I refer to that the uh, museum decided to cut the program, um, so we had funding to carry on, but the museum didn't want to. So after three years, they said, well, we will not have the contemporary art interventions anymore. And so it then stopped in 2014. Again, there, I don't know if the museum is going to be revisiting that idea, but the idea was um, there are a number of uh, temporary display cases in that gallery and they would then be used for such interventions. Thank you, Birgit. I think that's just about all the time we've got. So thank you very much for your talk and answering those questions. Pleasure. So, thank you.